Is there no limit to David's power? He seeks to make Jerusalem not only the political capital of north and south together, but now David seeks to make Jerusalem the seat of religious power. And who is there to stop him? Certainly not the conservatives who are loyal to the way of Yahweh. Who could object to David retrieving the Ark of the Covenant that had fallen into Philistines' hands? Eli, the priest in charge of cultic worship at Shiloh, had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Because of the permissiveness of their father, these two sons abused the office as mediators of the holy. Incredible as it was, these two sons took the Ark of the Covenant into battle, thinking this would ensure victory over their dreaded enemy, the Philistines. It had worked in the past. When the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant accompanying them into battle, they fought harder. It had become a tried and true formula, using religious speech and symbols and the build-up to war to guarantee legitimacy for one's cause. No one likes to die in vain. To believe that their fighting is to fill the pockets of their greedy king. National interests must be threatened along with one's way of life. Right must be on the side of might. The gods must give their assent to war, hence the use of religious speech and symbols in the build-up to war and in the prosecution of the war. But something went terribly wrong this time. The Philistines saw the Ark of the Covenant in battle and knew their end was near unless they fought harder. And they did. So much so that they routed the Israelites. They captured the Ark. Eli's sons Hophni and Phinehas were killed in battle. And as you can see, Judgment comes to the house of Eli when the holiness of God broke out in unpredictable ways. Even the Philistines were not able to contain the Ark of the Covenant when housed in their century. Funny things began to happen to their deity. So much so, the Philistines took this as an omen <coughs> and paid Abinadab to take care of the Ark. And that is exactly what Abinadab did for 20 years until David brought his army to take it back to Israel and his new home, Jerusalem. David is probably the only leader capable of retrieving such a mighty symbol of God's power and presence. So once again, we've come full circle with those who seek to exploit the holiness of God for their own advantage. David knows that if Shiloh remains the cultic center of power in the north, with devout pilgrims coming every year to make sacrifices, the priest in the north remain a threat to his power, unless the ark is lodged at Jerusalem. That way, pilgrims will come to Jerusalem to make sacrifice before the oldest and most revered relic in Israel's past. Truly, this is a bold move by one who is the Lord's anointed. Today, God has blessed David's rise to power. Why should the taking of the ark be any different than the taking of Jerusalem? All of David's plans to use the holy to legitimate royal power are on track <coughs> until the ark hits a bump in the road. The ark lurches left and Uzzah's hand touched what must not be touched. A breakout of God's holiness occurred that shocked everyone. Uzzah suddenly drops dead. His reward for protecting the ark is death. Clearly, this must be a sign that God does not approve of David's ambitious plans. Arrangements are made that a man named Obed Edom be constricted to care for the ark until David decides what to do. 
So David and his men returned to Jerusalem empty-handed, but not everyone's hand is empty on account of the ark. We are told that God blessed Obed-Edom and his household so much that the word gets back to David. David not wanting the blessed to go to Obed when it should rightly go to him. After all, he is the Lord's anointed. This must be a sign that the way has been cleared to carry the ark to Jerusalem as originally planned. This time, David succeeds where he previously failed. The parade is in high gear when Michael, David's wife, and more importantly, Saul's daughter, sees David behaving in a much undignified manner that she rebukes David. But David is not the Lord's anointed for nothing. No one lays a hand on David without paying a price. And the price for Michael is barrenness. The house of Saul has no future. The holiness of God has broken out yet again in unpredictable ways. What to make of this story from the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel is the subject of the rest of the sermon. For those who prefer the plain meaning of the text, I guess the story shows that the holiness of God refuses to be tamed. It is always a beast capable of breaking out in ways that alarm our sensibilities. Uzzah disregarded instructions about caring for the ark. According to the instructions given in Exodus, the ark was to be carried on poles, not on an oxen cart. Given that David disregarded God's law, an accident was waiting to happen, but why take it out on Uzzah? If any should be punished, it should have been David who sought to manipulate the holy to solidify his hold on power. But this is not the way the real world works back then or even now. Our leaders rarely suffer for their manipulation the holy to legitimate royal power. Take, for instance, Constantine, who saw in the vision the sign of a cross and had his men put it on their shields in the battle at the Milvivian Bridge. Constantine went so far as baptizing his army in the river as preparation for their holy assault. Ironically, the only part that was not baptized was their sword hand. It is this hypocrisy that calls prophets and poets to decry the use of the holy in legitimating an unholy act such as war. William Shakespeare has Richard III speak these memorable lines. But then I sigh with a piece of scripture. Tell them that God bids us to do evil for good and thus I clothe my naked villainy with odd ends stolen forth of holy writ and seem a saint when most I play the devil. Thus, according to Shakespeare, one can use religious speech and religious symbols for unholy purposes. David did it. Constantine did it. All presidents since the founding of this republic have done it. And our present president does it as well. It matters not that the present president is a Christian or professes to be a Christian. What matters is the willingness to use religious speech and religious symbols to justify penultimate purposes in the name of the ultimate. It is the equivalent of using the Lord's name in vain. It is the equivalent of carrying the Ark of the Covenant into battle as if it guarantees success. It may be the equivalent of tanks parading down the streets of D.C. displaying America's military power as if that guarantees success. 
Some have even suggested that our present president has been anointed by God for a holy purpose like Cyrus. Never mind that his lifestyle bears little resemblance to any holiness that I am familiar with. In the Old Testament or the New Testament... If he is anointed to a holy purpose like Cyrus, it might not be as an instrument of salvation, but of judgment. Maybe the elevating of America as the new Jerusalem, the eternal city not made with hands, is likened to Hophni and Phinehas bringing the Ark of the Covenant into battle because this strategy worked before, it's bound to work now. What they and we forget is that the strength of a nation is not in religious or political symbols, be they the ark or the flag. It matters not how many times God's name is invoked or how many patriotic flags are waved or how many tanks roll down the streets of D.C. The strength of a nation is our relationship to Almighty God. Do we truly love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? And do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Is America a blessing to God? Let us not presume that God will always bless America irrespective of how she treats the least of these in our midst. Hophni and Phineas eventually face the judgment of God for using religious speech and symbols for unholy purposes. One day we may experience a similar fate. For the pattern in the book of Judges is forgetting, apostasy, judgment, then deliverance. The children of Israel kept forgetting the blessings they were experiencing were from the hand of Almighty God. The worship of other gods or living life as if there is no God soon crept in. Then calamity would strike. In the book of Judges, it was the Philistines. In our day, it could be the collapse of Wall Street or the collapse of the Twin Towers. Either was a blow to our economy and our psyche. Our invulnerability was pierced like a suit of armor. In the aftermath, we cried out for deliverance just like Israel did in the time of the judges, and God heard our cries and sent deliverance. But this time might be different. Unless we come to our senses before the holiness of God breaks out against us in ways that spells destruction for individuals and for the nation. And why should those like Uzzah, who are trying to right the ark from falling, be punished for trying to save democracy and the rule of law? David found out the hard way that God is not so easily manipulated for political purposes. So David abandons his plan to bring the ark into Jerusalem and let Obed take care of it, and take care of it he did. And he was blessed for it, so much so that David sees this as a sign to bring the ark into Jerusalem and capture the blessings for himself. But what if our political leaders did not fervently invoke God's name to bless but sought to govern life as God blessed it at creation. When he said to those created in God's image to have dominion over creation in such a way that brings life, not death, hope rather than despair, peace instead of enmity between one another, instead of bearing the mark of Cain that kills his brother and then denies that he is his brother's keeper, we seek to bear the mark of Christ, the one who came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Instead of praying empty words and hackney phrases that have lost their power, why not let our life become a prayer?
Dietrich Bonhoeffer believed that the German Christians had so abused the holiness of God in Germany during the Nazification of church and society that he believed in the aftermath of the war that the church must not tell the world how to live for her words would ring hollow. Instead, it should be a time of prayer and righteous deeds. I wonder if the time has not come again, especially in the wake of evangelical Christianity that resembles the likes of Constantine to use religious language and actions to justify the actions of the state in the aftermath of this war on decency, democracy, and truth-telling. The church will need to pray and to do righteous deeds for the sake of the world. Abraham Lincoln was far from being a perfect president. But even amid the war, when men and women were sorely tempted to listen to their lesser angels, Lincoln did not. Lincoln refused to presume that God was on his side. When asked by a reporter whose side God was on, the north or the south, Lincoln reminded him that it was more important to be on the Lord's side. Then in his second inaugural address noted that both read the Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Hophni and Phineas found this out the hard way. And so did David when the holiness of God broke out against Uzzah. May we learn this as well before it's too late. Moreover, let us remember as we come to this communion table that the Lord's anointed finds fullest expression not in David, but in Jesus Christ. It is this Jesus who said, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Truly it is enemy law that Jesus beckons his followers to practice, so that the holiness of God may break out in life-giving ways. C.K. Chesterton understood this when he said, It is not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It's that it's never been tried. This enemy love broke out on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Where else will it break out? Let it be our callous hearts that breaks so that the love of God may break out in love and compassion for everyone in need of deliverance. Let no child be separated from their parents tonight because they sought asylum and now find themselves treated less than humane. Remember, judgment always follows apostasy. May America seek to be a blessing to Almighty God as we seek to live out our founding creeds and follow the teachings of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.